Hi everyone. Got a bit of a different video today. Normally this channel features 1994 through 1996 GM B-body content, which includes the Chevy Caprice, Impala SS, Buick Roadmaster, and even the Cadillac Fleetwood all have a similar rear-wheel drive design. But besides those vehicles, I also have an interest in antique cars and trucks and antique equipment and construction equipment. Ever since I was a kid from about the age six through my teenage years, I enjoyed construction sites. Old machinery was fascinating to me, anything old. Anything that spun or moved or made noise. Newer machinery and construction sites are neat, but they don't have the same feel as I remember as a kid. The difference could just be the old analog equipment that they used back then, you know, cable shovels and things like that, versus the modern hydraulic equipment, which just doesn't seem to have the same look and feel to me, or it could just be my age. At night, when there was no more equipment to watch, I enjoyed it when my parents drove through road construction areas, and I got to see dozens of barricade lights flashing away at night. I was certainly fascinated by those lights. They were hypnotizing. I remember seeing them mounted to metal barrels in the 70s. I was pretty young then. Then eventually, those were replaced by plastic barrels. And today, I predominantly see the upright rectangular plastic panels, which really aren't very interesting. I also remember seeing these lights attached to various road signs, and especially the A-frame barricades when they would uh, like dig up something on the side of the road. As a kid, I even built a few of those barricades myself out of sawhorses. At the same time, I started a collection of these lights. And keep in mind, this was before the internet, before eBay. I had to acquire them the hard way. But as life moved on, I kind of got out of that collection and moved on to other things. But for some reason, I usually kept and still keep one of these lights in every garage and basement space. Some place that, you know, where I work a lot, I'll just have one of those lights mounted somewhere and it'll just be blinking away. They keep me company as I work. They flash away tirelessly and I've put power supplies in all of them so you can just plug them in. There were always lights that were basket cases, though, and they just stayed in a box in my attic, waiting for the right moment. I decided that one of my shops was missing one of these lights and wanted to add it. So I grabbed one out of the dusty box in the attic to restore. Instead of grabbing one, though, I grabbed two. One will go into my shop. And I decided to restore the other one for a friend. So the light on the right here was in pieces when I got it from a flea market. At least that's what I remember. It was a basket case, basically as you see it here, just pieces everywhere, just in a pile. It hasn't flashed once in my possession. I've probably had it since I was around eight or nine, so it's been at least 40 years since it last flashed. Maybe longer. As a child and early adult, I didn't have the skill, desire, or time to restore it. But let's see if that time is now. I'm not sure about the age of this light. I can't find any information about the company that manufactured it. But since it's metal, I'm guessing it's from the late 50s through the mid to late 60s time frame. Because eventually all these style lights moved to plastic cases, similar to the Dietz 670 light on the left. I'm starting this recording with the project already in progress, beginning with stripping off layers of paint. I wasn't able to record everything. And this video does feature flashing lights, so if you're sensitive to that, please take that into consideration while watching this video. Somebody made a bad choice even before I owned it, so over 40 years ago, to paint it this silver color. Uh, I know it was originally yellow because that little hint there, 
and uh, when I sanded off some of the silver paint on the box itself, there was yellow under it. I don't have a sandblaster and I'm out of flapper discs for the angle grinder and plus this particular spot here with the label that I want to preserve under the blue tape. Just use a good old fashioned wire wheel.
missed a spot there. So when I purchased this light from a yard sale, I also had a piece of wood with some sort of small electric fan and this bracket mounted to it for something else. They were totally separate pieces. It was the same guy selling it, and I have a very fuzzy memory of it because we're talking about 30, 40 years ago. And it has the same silver paint on it. I decided to cut this up. But it's really weird that like these came from the same guy and that light was painted with the same silly silver paint. I'm not really sure. Some sort of aluminum paint or something. But uh Yeah. So let me show you what I'm gonna do with these and repurpose them. So that's 
basically what I have in mind. I still need to trim those brackets down. I gotta make these a little shorter. And get a light socket mounted in there. And we'll be good to go. Here's the part that came with the light. And this piece here would have extended up into the light housing. And there would have been a longer piece here that extended further up into the light from underneath. This is what a more modern version, well, modern in the 80s, would have looked like with a different style light, but this, is, this tube is way too fat to fit in this old metal light housing where this one fits. But you can see it's just a little too short. It needs to be about the same length. So that's why I'm making these metal brackets. That's what these will be for. And then I'll cut this to the correct length and mount a light socket in it. Let's put all this stuff together and make a functional light out of all this. All right. Got the bracket fabricated. I still need to solder the light socket onto the bracket, but that's what it's going to look like. Yeah, this is one of the reasons I love working on old things. But even the light socket, you know, can be fully disassembled. It's all modular. So now I could just solder this piece right to that bracket. I've already marked the uh, alignment marks with a Sharpie marker there. One small detail that I got to get right is this light bulb needs to be clocked properly. So the filament here has two little fingers that stick up like this in this incandescent bulb. And uh, the filament needs to face forward and backward for proper light pattern. Especially because this is called a Fernell lens. I think that's what it's called. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct or not. But the filament needs to line perfectly up with the middle there. The middle spot here. And it needs to be clocked correctly so that the maximum surface area of the filament is facing front and back. So that it hits the middle of that Fernell lens properly and then spreads the light pattern throughout the lens. All right, here's some flux. And we're gonna, the solder variety for this job is just gonna be standard lead pipe solder. Yes, it's lead, quiet down. I won't be eating tacos while I'm doing this. And I'll wash my hands afterwards. But lead's the best thing to use for steel like this. All right, turning it sideways, I was able to get a much better solder joint there. I'll just do the other side the same way. What's the saying? Uh, grinder and paint makes the welder I ain't. I don't think that's the same for soldering. Well, it doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to work. All right, uh, the inside of this is a little corroded, so let's use a round file and clean the rust and corrosion out of this socket. And we'll put some dielectric grease when we put this back together. All right. 
point. That's good. Here's the spring that goes in there. And it's pretty rusty looking. So we'll hit that with a wire wheel real quick. The handle of my flux brush here does a pretty good job of uh, holding the spring in place while I run it through the wire wheel here. Pretty neat. All right. And how about that? Spring is no more rust, good as new. All right, we're just going to take some of this grease and just put it on the different electrical components that go into this assembly. So there's our ground wire. It goes in first and then our spring. Get it in there. And then our positive terminal there. It looks like it's in good shape. I'll hit it with a little bit too. Drop it through. Now this light is not intended to be used outside anymore. I'm not re restoring it for usage outside. But this will just help make sure there's just no atmospheric corrosion just from, you know, just sitting around. High humidity areas, things like that would impact this. All right, I think it's done. The white housing itself is a three-piece housing, and that's a very different design than say one of these more modern lights it's all just a two-piece lens on there they've been using these two-piece lenses i don't know way back into the 60s here's an example of a deets 670 pretty old example again it uses two-piece lens so it goes back pretty far. So one way that I tried to date this, there's a 58 right there by my thumb. So I thought maybe, maybe this is 1958. So I had to do some more forensics to try to determine whether that's possible, whether this thing could have been made in the late 50s into the early 60s. So the next step was let's take a look at the circuit that came with the original unit. And at first I thought this circuit was bad, but then I just realized I wasn't hooking it up right. And I also didn't know what voltage it ran off of. So let's take a deeper dive into this circuit a little bit without getting too geeky and too nerdy. I'm just going to point out a few details here. So the transistor that came with this, it's a metal can transistor. And it's definitely original. Uh, by the way, this entire circuit board was encased in wax. It was in this little tray here. The circuit board was encased in wax, and what I did was I took the whole wax blob out of this case, put it in this metal tray, and I heated it up with my heat gun, and got the wax turned into complete liquid like water, and then dumped the wax out. I wish I would have saved it, but I dumped it in the garbage can. But that exposed every all the secrets on this board. Once I did that, I apologize. I didn't film any of that, but anyways, back to this board metal transistor. It's a two N 
one, two, seven, three. And the next part of it is 4914. And I thought maybe that could have been a date code for like 1949, 14th week, like they do for a lot of components. Usually that's, uh, there's some sort of a date code like that. But 49 seems really old. So I'm going to assume that's not a date code. However, what I did find is this online and this is some sort of a data sheet for this transistor the 2n1273 here's the date on this august of 1959 so we know this transistor existed then and these metal can transistors usually existed around that era and were phased out in the 60s, I believe. Definitely phased out by the 70s. He still saw them around a little bit, but they were mostly phased out. Now there's another transistor on this board right here, and it's the standard plastic shell kind. So that might date this a little later, maybe the early 60s. But if you look, this capacitor is a very old style. It's a 10 microfarad capacitor, 15 volts. And then these resistors are also a very old style. And same with this diode. There's also a tiny light sensor on here, which does not appear to be a CDS type cell, a photosensitive resistor. And I was a little puzzled about what that could have been until I found some more information online from Texas Instruments, because that's the original manufacturer of this transistor. Transistor circuit design, pretty cool old book, just a PDF that I found. 1963. So again, we're in the late 50s, early 60s time frame, like I originally thought this might this light might have been from. So that fits. And then there's a chapter in that book, chapter 32, that talks specifically about light flashers. And you could pause this to read it yourself, but one of the things it says here is transistor-operated flashers are now replacing flare pots and me mechanically operated flashers for reasons of reliability, safety, compactness, and efficiency. The construction barricade flasher is the most common flasher application at present. The transistorized flasher runs as long as 60 days on a single battery. Doesn't say what kind of battery. I guess they're all, uh, they were all different at the time, but later on, like these lights, they just take six volt lantern batteries same with that one over there. And then this one's even newer model that takes D cells. But this metal light, I don't even think takes either of those. Inside the metal light, I found this. And this is just a jumper between two batteries. It's a very odd plug. I've had a hard time finding out any vintage or antique batteries that would take this type of setup until I stumbled across some of the antique radio batteries from the 40s and 50s. Uh, they called them A, B, and C batteries that, driv that drove tube type radios, portable radios. And the A, B, and C types all produce different voltages. So it's possible that one of the, two of those batteries would have been either in parallel or in series inside that metal case for this flasher that I'm restoring. I haven't been able to confirm the size yet. Um, I gave up after a while searching. Uh, it's very hard to find information on very antique batteries because the majority of them leaked and were thrown away and destroyed long, long ago. So I may never know exactly what battery was in there, but I'm thinking it was one of those antique radio batteries. So the next 
thing I wanted to show you was back to this chapter 32. Here's our schematic right there. That schematic, or even more specifically, and I'll, I'll let you read this if you want to pause the video. It's really dry. But here's the next page, more information, dry stuff until we get here. That schematic is closely representing this. I don't think the values are the same. I mean, you're close. I'm not gonna spend the time translating those resistor stripes right now. It's not important. The important thing is a lot of these flashers of this era and later, even into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, used a very similar circuit until the 80s whenever they converted to a chip. But all the transistorized ones used a very similar circuit. And I'll show you another one. This is the one I'm actually gonna put in the light. This one was a bad, a bad circuit from a 60s Dietz light, uh, similar to one of these, similar to this one here that's not running right now, but um, it would have had a very similar circuit board in it. And this one was bad, and I replaced both transistors. These aren't the original transistors. None of the resistors are original. None of the capacitors are original. I literally resoldered every part on this board. I stripped this board down to nothing, and I resoldered all the parts back in it, including two capacitors. It originally came with one. Two in parallel got the right flash frequency. I think I tried one, and it was too, too fast. So I went ahead and put two in, and that seems to have... Uh, seemed to have worked just fine. And one other thing I wanted to point out was this. The switch S1, so in this circuit diagram would be this guy here. Switch S1 can be replaced with a solar cell switch to turn off the flasher automatically in daytime, such as such arrangement will roughly double the battery life in unintended locations. That's interesting. Because a majority of them used CDS cells or photoresistors later, uh, like this era, would have used that type of mechanism to shut the light off during the day. But this one has this little rectangular guy, which when I first took this apart, I didn't know what it was. And I'm pretty sure now that's a tiny little, possibly a photovoltaic solar cell. So I think this is almost an exact explanation of this circuit and they just don't show where that solar cell would go in this circuit they just say the switch could be replaced by it but i think it's more complicated than that a solar cell would have to supply some sort of extra voltage to turn on and off a transistor it would probably offer a bias to turn off one of the two transistors and that's where i think why this one only has three resistors and this one has four total because the diode also is being factored into this solar cell. Um, that's connected directly. The diode's connected directly to it. And so is this first resistor. So I'm thinking that the extra resistor might just come in for the shutoff circuit. This project's already taken up a lot of time. If I get enough comments or if I get enough questions, Someday I might try to make a schematic diagram of this exact circuit, but we're not even using this. This is a six volt board, which I also had to figure out by process of elimination. First, I had to figure out the wiring and here's the power input on it. And it requires six volts. And believe it or not, the red wire is actually negative and the white wire is positive. And that kind of threw me off too when I was originally testing and I, was in, I ended up hooking it up backward first. But I started at a very low voltage and ramped it up and it wasn't working so I didn't ramp it up. I started at like one or two volts and these normally these flasher circuits will start becoming active at only just one or two volts and I didn't want to blow it up. So that's how I was able to test the polarity was to try one way and then try another on really low voltage. And here's your output to the light socket to flash the bulb. And then these extra wires are for the, what they call a solar cell. They call that a solar cell in this book. 
this Texas Instruments transistor circuit design reference book. Anyways, that's a very long-winded explanation as to why I felt that this, this circuit board, along with the light itself, goes pretty far back. It has to be the, you know, late 50s if you want to go by perhaps the, you know, that stamp, that date code molded into this lens here. If you put all the pieces together and assume that that's 58 and maybe the early 60s, you know, these lenses could have ran for several years. So the date code didn't change. And then these lights were built maybe in the uh, late 50s, early 60s for a couple of years. And it's also possible this transistor was replaced at one point in its life. So it could have been a metal one too. I just don't know. But they also made these TO92s pretty early. Okay, the internet tells me that the TO92 transistor case design appeared around 1966. So either this was replaced or this board was made in the mid-60s then. So that could also date the light into the mid-60s. So right now our range is 1958 to probably about 1966 for this light. And that's about the best I can do without any other information. Now, I tried to look up this company online, which is the original label. I'm gonna be putting this back on the light after it's finished uh, being painted. I looked up this Flasher Flare SE Ink and from Tampa, Florida. And I only found very little information about it. It looked like the company was still around into the early 2000s, maybe rebooted as a safety equipment company. I couldn't find any more history than that. I couldn't find how long it was around for just doing basic Google searches. I did not try to dig any deeper. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I can't find any information about this light regardless, no matter how much I searched for it. Newsflash pun intended. After filming that last segment, a few weeks later, I discovered some new information. Two patent numbers. The first one being in 1960. I suspect it was approved in 1964 by Flasher Flare Southeast Incorporated, Tampa, Florida. Pretty amazing. So feel free to look up that patent number if you want to know more information. The second patent that I discovered is a little bit more interesting. It was filed in 1964 and perhaps approved in 1966. Same company. Flasher Flare Southeast Incorporated, Tampa, Florida. This one comes with a better di couple better diagrams. The first one being the same as the other. A light assembly with four screws around it with, with a detachable lens. But this is a more interesting diagram. There's your four screws, the outer frame assembly and then your two lenses that bolt to it and then here's the assembly that holds the light to the metal base and yes this light that we're restoring also has these two bolts going up and then two nuts that go through there so this is this strongly represents that light that we're working on even this por portion of the picture here looks very similar to our light So I believe this is definitely the patent for at least the light assembly part of the unit. One really interesting thing here, the lamp head comprises cylindrical rim which has a resilient liner or sponge rubber or the like bonded to the inner periphery thereof. The rim is welded or otherwise rigidly secured to an annular washer 
a hollow bolt having a central bore and a head extends through the annular washer and an aperture in the top wall of the casing and has a nut threaded, <laughs> threadedly mounted thereon, which serves to positively secure the rim to the top wall. And even though it doesn't have a threaded bolt with a hole, it does have what appears to be perhaps a conduit flange or a conduit connector. But hey, they use what they got. So I hope that helps shed some light, pun intended, on the age, how it was designed and how it was made. It certainly corresponds to the electronics forensics that we did. I was guessing 1958 to 1966, and well, there we go. The patent was released in 1966 there. And the first patent was applied for in 1960 and released in 1964. So that we again, we have the range 1960 through 1966. So let's move on now to the next step. Let's build the power supply next. Then we'll move on to doing the finishing paint job and then reassembly. I'm going for a little bit of a steampunk vibe here. I got some just miscellaneous parts here from an old computer hard drive caddy and a old fashioned 200 microfarad capacitor here that the voltage is pretty high on this, 250 volts. I just need the 200 microfarads for this power supply. And uh, so I just decided to take make some brackets for it. So this was connected to this bracket, which came off of that hard drive caddy. I cut that away. I bent it like this, and then that'll go like that on the capacitor. And then I can zip tie that capacitor to the bracket. That whole thing gets mounted to this power supply tray. This is even a vintage zip tie that I saved from something else. It's pretty old. I 
another vintage zip tie matches the other one there's a good chance that this both of these zip ties held a capacitor down on some other circuit board I usually tend to save zip ties that I cut. And these ones look like they're yellowed and aged for quite some time. I know that might sound a little extreme for a project like this, but might as well use these old zip ties for something, right? Been saving them all these years, why not? Okay. There we go. This primer's getting old and it's getting kind of splattery. I'll use, uh, I'll take a look and see if I have any other primer. And I'll uh, hit this with a couple more coats tomorrow after this initial dusting coat dries. Maybe to help with some of the splatter, I'm gonna soak this, uh, this nozzle in some paint thinner overnight too. Would you believe that all three of these primer cans are bad? There was plenty left in them to finish that project, but oh well, they're too old. They've been sitting around too long. This is a homemade woodblock wet sander. <laughs> been using it for years actually on different projects. All right. You can see all the definite high spots. This box isn't gonna be straight. I'm not trying to build a car here, so. I'm just trying to take care of the basics. So I'll hit it with one more coat of primer. Get it dried off first. Primer does not reject water very well. 
So I'm just gonna hit it with a heat gun real quick, make sure all the water's completely dried off before I hit the next coat. So what color should we repaint this light? Well, let's see here. We have three choices. Caterpillar yellow, Detroit diesel green, or Mopar distributor tan. Come on, guys. I know you want the Detroit diesel green. But that doesn't belong on that light. So we'll put the yellow on there. Third coat. All right, fourth coat, fifth coat, I, I don't know. And one more for good measure.
Okay, that was first coat. Two coats of clear coat. Okay, we'll let that dry for about 30 minutes and hit it with another coat. Yep, this is why I don't love painting things. I usually make some dumb mistake, and in this case, I went to do the corners because that's usually where, you know, chips happen the most. So I did a little bit of an extra coat on the corners, and this is what happened, so. Redo. Because of the way these lenses work, it's best to make sure this bulb is centered right in the middle of the lens.
just an old computer cord. It's a fairly standard fuse holder. It takes a automotive style fuse. I think I have a one amp in there, but anything from half amp to one amp should be good for this particular application. It'll go in there, it just doesn't know it yet. kind of test fitting everything here. Fuse holder looks like it clears everything. All right, I have to do the unthinkable here and use a self-tapper for the ground screw. But the good news is I'll put it in the tray down at the bottom there.
Tell me if that light goes on. Hey, hey. how about that? Guess what's next? Yep, we get to put this part on. All right, let's get the uh, blinker head put on there. And hooked up. Maybe this will help the pinch point. Yeah. Okay. Before we close it up. Let's test it first. Okay. Perfect. This was the original screw that came with it. And I think the intention was to countersink it. in here. But once I do that, it'll be too hard to open. I'm wondering if just to leave it sticking out like that. Remember earlier I saved that wire insulation off that black cord? Well, That's what we're doing with it. We're going to stick it on here. It's a little tight. Not gonna lie. There we go. How's that? 
I like the way that looks. But we're not done yet. We need to put that sticker back on where it belongs. I thought about reproducing this sticker. But I just touched this one up. It's, it's nice having the original one to put back rather than reproducing this. Little side note here. I was digging out my stack of newspapers to put the adhesive on this sticker. And in the pile was this. I forgot I even had this. Huh. But yes, I was at this event. It was a heck of a lot of fun. Too bad they don't do these big events anymore. But man, was that a lot of fun that year. So anyways, back to the thing at hand. Now I'm not going to spray on, on this. I'm going to keep that. Pretty neat, huh? Hey, there's a 71 Roadrunner with a 383. Nice. I'm using this uh, 3M adhesive spray. All right, we'll let that sit for about a minute or two. It says to let it dry until it gets tacky. We get one shot, huh? And yes, that bothers me that it's not centered and it's a little crooked, but that's where the original one went. And that's where I'm putting it back. Because I was able to leave a little outline there when I removed the original paint. I don't have a squeegee that small to use. So what I did was I took a plastic potty knife, put a little piece of electrical tape on it to make sure this edge is really smooth. And let's see if that'll help us smooth this out good without hurting it. Yeah, I think we have a winner. There it is. It's not perfect. And I'm not going to try to overwork this and damage it any further. So we'll just call it done there. I enjoyed working on this. And hopefully you guys and gals will enjoy actually seeing what it took to bring this light back to life and some of the research involved in determining its age. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.